Um, Ajalab Sami is my name. Um, I'm a software engineer currently working with Meta. Um, I have over seven years of experience working with globally distributed teams across uh, different platform and industries. And it's been fun for me over over time and also a learning experience for me as well while contributing my skill. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, prior, now, prior to working on Meta, uh, coincidentally, I've been working with health companies, crossover health, vastly health, you know, health, health, health. And um, yeah, it's been interesting. Okay, straight to the business of the day. Um, end to when testing. Okay, so what's end to end testing? Uh, as the word described, uh, we are testing application, our mobile application in this case, end to end. We are testing from a user perspective. Uh, we are testing functionalities to ensure they work. It's as if you're dealing with a non-technical manager, who all, it, uh, all that matters to the person is, does it work? So that's the aim of end-to-end -end test. You wanna make sure all functionalities of your application work end-to-end. -end. Um, this can be done in different fashion. Um, you can follow the horizontal end-to-end -end testing approach or you follow the vertical end-to-end -end test approach. Uh, for the horizontal test end-to-end uh, -end approach, um, you are only concerned with the UI and the integration layer. So essentially, is the application displaying what is meant to display? And is it doing what it's meant to do? But then when it comes to vertical end-to-end -end testing, you are concerned with the entire process. You know, you want to build full confidence of the application around the application development cycle. And this is what is more, recom what more recommended. Um, we are saying first you have your test data preparation. Uh, you write unit tests to ensure every unit of your test actually works. You also want to, you also want to write integration tests to ensure um, every bit and pieces that your app connects to, you know, work with actually works as expected. And also you now want to get to the UI test to ensure everything works as expected. Um, so how do you perform end-to-end -end tests? So first you want to set up your test environment. Um, you want to analyze the software and hardware requirements. You want to list out your system response. Uh, you want to list you want to list down all testing methods required to test these responses. Um, you want to design the test cases, and then you want to run and save the test result. Um, and in case there's any problem or any issue, you want to have like screenshots or, you know, um, information that you can reference to fix that can inform you on how that anomaly happened and how you can fix the problem. And then you analyze all requirements all over again to see whether you're on track or not. So a couple of testing framework that we have, we have Selenium, we have Appium, we have Cypress. Uh, among this, uh, we also have Detox. Among this, Appium is like more of like a mobile testing platform, but not as efficient as the one we'll be considering. Uh, so what are the benefits of end-to-end -end tests? Uh, first, it helps you to test your application from a user perspective, uh, which reduces risk in the future. Um, you want to also verify um, workflows, you know, uh, when you build an application, you're trying to solve problem, you know, implement some business logic, you want to make sure all these have been implemented as expected and there are no surprises when your app get, it gets into production. So um, you want to make sure, because there is, this, there is this problem that do happen when a user that have no idea of an, of an app before is just using the app for the first time, uh, the moment they encounter a series of issues, they tend not to use the app anymore until it gets like public. Some never even get to use it again, uh, while some really find it really uh, difficult to, you know, try to use the app again because they are not convinced that the app is stable. Uh, you want to avoid this to the barest minimum. So as so in order to avoid that, you want to write your end-to-end -end test and make sure every functionality, every major core requirement is, um, you know, fulfilled and is working as expected before uh, you go live. Uh, yeah. Uh, you also want to have the confidence, yeah, especially uh, when you're building an application, you want, the, you want the team to have confidence, to build confidence around your application development cycle so that, you know, you you are not having like 50, 50 chance when it comes to does this app work and you don't even, you're not even sure what the result will be. 
Um, now let's talk about the best practices when it comes to end-to-end -end testing. So at, at the core of end-to-end -end tests, you want to keep an end-user perspective. How will the user use this application in the first instance? What are the things they tend to do? How will they approach the app? You know, stuff like that. Are they going to like be opening it from a link? Are they going to be launching it from the mobile app? Are they going to be launching it from notification? These are ways and you know channels by which you actually um, approach your test as well and make sure you, rep you reproduce or simulate these uh, um, you know, ideal scenarios. You also want to assess the, um, the you want to also make your test to be risk based. Uh, what are the things that could go wrong? What will be the impact of these things going wrong? And then you also want to maintain the right order. You want to execute your unit testing, integration testing, and then you want to run your critical small test uh, in form of the UI test to ensure things are working as expected. You also want to manage your test environment and data. You want to make sure your data, your test data are actually like um, mirroring what a real day-to-day -day use will be like. Uh, it's not usually 100% possible. You want to try as well as, you want to try as much as possible to be as close to the reality as possible. So these are issues that, these are mistakes that you can actually make, um, especially if you are new to, um, you know, writing E2E -E test. Um, you don't want to ignore flaky text. So by the way, what is flaky text? Flaky text are just like, um, you know, random errors that just happen. You, you're not sure about why they happen because maybe when you just click on, you know, the run test again, it just pass. So um, a lot of times there are uh, users use an app and then they tell you there's an issue with it. And you'll be like, but I tested this thing the other time and I don't have any issue with it. Or well, it passed our test, what's going on? Um, they just happen randomly. So you want to investigate random errors and try to you know, hunt them down and see why they could occur in the first instance. Um, you want to avoid selector nightmare, selector maintenance nightmare. Um, essentially, you want to make sure um, your selectors are being clear. For example, if imagine you your selector uh, when you're writing test is you want to make sure this test is present, but then because the uh, when the content or marketing team says the content should be different, they should change it. You might have forgotten that there's a test that ensure that that text is there, and then before you know it test will be failing for no reason just because you change the content instead you could if there is something that if, there, if you're trying to test for something that can be changing you could use something like label or id or test ids or you know some other means of um, you know selection i uh, will talk about that in the following in the next slide then don't create dependent test if you want to test the login flow test the login flow independently and then you want to test something else test them you know independently don't make you don't don't write a test in such a way that if one of them fail the rest will fail just make it write in such a way that um they are not dependent on each other so each of them runs if they fail you know what to address and if they pass you know you're all good and then there is an issue too soon so whenever you discover any issue or any problem you want to run the test again in most cases ideally you want to run like three times and um, if it fails then you try to investigate what happens but just raising an issue because you know test fails it's like raising an issue too soon because it might just be uh, an, a scenario of a flaky test so um, the tool we want to you will be uh, will be examining for it to be test for React Native is um, Detox. Uh, Detox is a describe is described as a gray box end to end testing and automation framework for React Native. It's a tool that was uh, built by the Wix team and is really really awesome. Um, unlike other alternatives, um, it's 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 reduced flackiness to the various minimum. It's very, very versatile and it's run faster than um, other um, ones. Um, so this is a sample detox test uh, for login flow. So you have a describe block um, that says, okay, describe login flow. Um, it should log in with email and password. So you're trying to test whether you know it works as expected. Um, first, I wanna make sure the Inputs, uh, uh, input for email is available, is visible. And then I want to say, okay, um, elements. So the reason why we're using await is because UI can, you know, you have to wait for the UI to come up within a reasonable, reasonable amount of time before, uh, you know, 
uh, you take some actions. So for example, you want to do the action, you want to type some text, which is don't do at uh, John and do.com. And then the second one, the password, and then we have the login button, and then you tap on it or something like that. We'll be tearing this down in the next slide. What are they and what make up this uh, particular sample test? So in detox, we have what we call the selectors of matches. So you want to do something like by ID, by text, by label, by you know, by different things which are selectors. So when you say element by ID, you're selecting by a test ID, by text, you're trying to look for a specific text within your UI or by label. So, um, and then you have expectation. So you expect something to be this. For example, you expect something to be visible. You expect something to exist. You expect something not to exist or to have a particular text. And then you have the action. So when you have your selector, you can select something and say you want to tap on it. You want to scroll on it. Normally what users will do when they hold an application. And what happens is after you write a test, a mobile application screen will actually pop up in form of, I mean, your simulator, uh, it could be the Android simulator or the iOS simulator. And then those actions will be performed automatically by the detox framework. Um, there are a couple of con device controls as well. Um, I'm referring to uh, the launch app. We have the reload React Native. You want to just reload the um, application alone. Uh, you want to open a particular URL um, within the application, uh, which could be either open an in-house browser or you want to, you know, do deep linking. Um, you want to send user notification and what's not. Um, there are a few limitations do with with uh, detox, which needs some work around. Um, how do you you know working with uh, external app dialogues like um, maybe Google sign in uh, button, uh, controlling other application processes, which is inter app uh, you know communication, or you know controlling the web view is still a limitation of detox. So it's good to know these limitations when uh, considering detox. Yeah. Um, one of the things you can also do um, is when you write in detox test, you could do cross platform testing. There's sometimes that your UI will be a little bit different for Android and another one. Another you have another you know test case. You have another um, you know UI flow or slight UI changes for um, Android. You know, so you want to do something like uh, you know platform the selects to um, undo them individually. Um, so let's look at tips and tricks for writing a to e test. So first, uh, you want to do um, test grouping. So um, you want to group test by their functionalities, you know, and then by user stories. So for example, you want to group uh, things that are related to authentic authentication in, uh, you know, in one place, and then you then start uh, breaking them down into, uh, you know, uh, user stories. Um, you also want to leverage on mocking when necessary. For example, you want to undo uh, maybe image upload or you want to undo some um, other specific tests. You don't want to like, um, there are a lot of complexities around, you know, making some of these things happen that, you know, I talk about in that process, uh, you know, uh, working with different um, processes at the same time. Uh, for instance, Detox doesn't have control over the native image picker, for example, but then you can mock around the library that is implementing the image picker. So that way it will just plug in that picture. It's just loading the picture or loading the audio or the PDF or what's not, and then you continue your normal flow. Um, you need you can also use global UIs. This is actually a technique that help you to ensure that your tests run as fast as possible. So your global UI could be like your logout button being somewhere. If the environment is test, your your logout button is somewhere so that anytime you want to quickly log out, you tap on log out so that you can do some other things again. Um, you also want to use uh, use shortcuts. So instead of um, await elements by id add to card or tap you want to create helpers like maybe element by id or tap by id for instance and then you just say tap by id add to card so that means you're going to be implementing that so it's kind of you know faster and more nifty uh deep linking so when interaction takes too long um you can use deep linking to actually you know um i call it like, so, like some sort of shortcut i hope you're following so um, you also want to have uh, your test titles. Um, 
individual test titles should look like uh, user stories. They should be able to, uh, for instance, you want to say user should be able to log in with username and password. And then, you know, you also want to mirror the SRC directory structure, um, just like the way your structure, your, co your code base is like structured. Um, also, when you are, your, when your app is going to production, you don't really need those test IDs and, you know, things that have to do with testing. So there are a couple of plugins. If you are using Babel directly, you can just use the Babel plugin remove test ID, which can help you to, you know, remove them. Also, we have detox instruments. They help you to measure the app performance, the core profiling data, your memory footprints, and ensure your app is, you know, your app is um, performing as um, uh, expected. Um, I would like, I would like us to, you know, I would like to stop at this point and, you know, get um, questions from us and I'll be glad to give you answers. Yeah. Thank you so much, Abdul Sami. I went through that um, really quickly. I think you can stop share. We have some questions. Um, already on Slido. Um, let me share my screen. Um, I think for the other parts of this call, we'll you know, have a conversation about how hectic end-to-end um, -end testing is like. But give me a minute, let me share my screen. Okay. All right. So we have quite some questions here. Uh, can we run end to end testing on production after release? If yes, how do you make sure generated data is cleaned up? Okay, so so um at the uh, during the presentation, I mentioned that when uh, one of the steps, key steps, when it comes to writing end-to-end -end test, if I testing generally, is to always create a testing environment. You don't test on production, right? Um, when you have a testing environment, you have a test data set, and then in fact almost all the time whenever you finish writing your test uh, whenever your test finish running you want to clean up that data um, we have a couple of things like uh, you know um, uh, we have something like before each after each before all you know all these um, hooks help you to ensure that cleanup is being made efficiently so that the previous data on a particular test is not even affected by the you know the next one so um essentially in development life cycle we have the development branch for example or let's say we have the local branch where you're doing your work we have the staging branch we have the production branch so your staging branch is more of like uh, where your stable code is you know being yeah, where you can see your stable code running and the development branch is actually you know meant for the real users so you don't um you know run tests specifically on uh the 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 production yeah all right um and the only thing is if users actually report that maybe there's some anomaly or some bug um in most cases you want to ask them to give you direction on how you can reproduce that error and then you check your own and in terms of you check the test that was run for that if your test did not cover that particular use case scenario you want to update your test to cover something after it has been fixed so that it doesn't uh, you know happen again and you also want to do regression to ensure you have not broken an existing test yeah okay so do you need to do end-to-end -end test as a developer considering the company already have testers okay this is actually like um a, let me say a structural high level question um in, in most companies they let me say in companies generally yeah. they when they have they, they some companies have a dedicated 
QA team. When you have a QA team, uh, I, I would say the most important test that you should write to the developer is usually um, unit test, integration test. Um, if your policy say you should still write end to end tests, of course you have to do that. But in a general case, on a general uh, on a general level, I think it's just you need test and uh, integration tests that are more important. Uh, your QA tests we handle the end to end testing on their own part. But if you don't have a QA team, um, you have to write end to end tests. It's just um very very important to ensure the confidence around the application before shipping it to the public. I'm curious to know, Abusami, just before we move to the next quest question, um, have you been in rules where you had to, um, you know, write end-to-end -end tests? And is this a requirement? Do you recommend that developers learn this in as much as this is a yeah. free rule, mm. so to speak? Okay. So, so um, well, lucky for me, I work in teams that have dedicated QA teams. I'm, I would say in most of the health companies I've worked at, they have dedicated QA team. So they test the application end to end on the, on the right test for it. Um, however, I've also been in teams where they don't even write the end to end test at all. And it's the users that are usually like the lead most test, which is usually a bad thing. And I've also worked in teams where end to end tests have been written. In fact, I can remember there are times where people will not get matched to, um, you know, to roles because they don't know, they are not familiar with any end-to-end -end, uh, testing tool. Um, however, this is this this um, presentation is around end-to-end -end tests for React Native. That's why we're considering detox. If you're considering writing end-to-end -to -end tests for a web platform, you should be considering something, uh, some library like uh, Selenium or Cypress. I personally love Cypress. Um, yeah. So right. next one. Uh, so yeah, it's an essential skill. Okay. How do you solve for limitations with detox? Uh, so solving for limitation with detox, uh, in most cases, whenever I'm met with a blocker that I have to do with limitation of detox, what I do is mocking. So I mock that implementation so that I can get past that gate and ensure that uh, you know implementation is working. So mocking is just like you simulate or you um, you kind of fake that into to act like it worked. For example, I want to um, implement file upload and I knew that I would need to work with another UI that is not part of the UI of an application, which is your image picker within your phone and all those things. You can mock it such a way that the moment you tap on the image picker button, you, you tap on the button that will, um, you know, that will invoke the image picker, it just fetch a particular picture within your directory and it will be filled on that particular space as if you have pass the image upload stage. Then manually, you want to test the image image uh, picker to ensure that it works as expected. Do you understand? Yeah. <laughs> okay, I hope that answers your question. Um, how long does it take to write an end-to-end -end test and how often should it be maintained? Okay, great. Uh, how long does it take to write end-to-end -end test? To be honest, uh, when, you, when you are building an application, so they ask you to implement a particular feature, and then you implement that feature, you're asked to fix a particular problem, and you fix that problem. Um, so um, you, you test the app by yourself, okay, you tap on those buttons, you ensure what you did work as expected. Just the way you tested it, you can write a test for that. And it's usually like as if you're just writing a report. It's like you're writing English. If we go back to the if we go back to the slide that I had earlier, um, it says describe login flow. It should log in with email and password. And then you say, okay, locate the element by ID email. It should be visible. Okay, that's visible. Normally, this is what you check visually by yourself. And then you say email type text. You want to type by yourself as well. And then you type in the password as well, you tap on it. Before you know it, I mean, this shouldn't take you more than five minutes to implement this. However, the only time it takes time is when it's running. So you watch it work and then you want to make sure nothing fails. So in most cases, then that will be taking like 10, 15 minutes, you know, down the line. The only thing though is uh, when you write end-to-end -end tests, as you features get more and more larger and huge, 
your um, test will be taking time to run. In fact, based on the question someone asked in the chat, it was asking that how do you fit it into your workflow? In most cases, you implement your feature, you write your end-to-end -end test, everything works as expected, and then you push your code, you raise a PR, you push your code and then you raise a PR. Now, in your PR, before anyone even look at your PR, your um, end-to-end -end test will be running in the background. So end-to-end, -end, E2E test for Android, E2E test for iOS, both of them are running in parallel. And then when everything passes, then they will then, you know, review your code and say, okay, this is what is good. Can you improve that? And then until those two tests pass before they merge your code. And there's also something called regression. The tests that have passed before, you they ensure that they also pass as well you don't want to spoil what is you don't want to you know the stroke was already working which is the essence of um, regression yeah hmm. but it, just before we go it seems like it's an infinite loop that means you never end testing so to speak because you just keep you need to keep you know um checking it to ensure that it passes. I don't, I'm, I don't know if you- No, 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 not really. Just like you adding a new thing, you don't want to see to like, you know, disrupt something that is already working. Oh, Do you get my point? Yeah. Okay. So. Got you. So I think you mentioned something about deep linking when you talked about mm. tips and tricks. You want to deep dive okay. into this. All right. So, um. I don't know whether you observe something. So probably maybe you are um, using a particular, you are on a particular website uh, or you're practically on maybe a social media app or something. And then you see uh, something like an invitation for you to join someone to maybe play some game or something. And then you click on that link and then you sign up. And after signing up, you just jump into that person's space and you start playing the game or something. Or a particular link that says, okay, this is a promo code. And then after you're done uh, signing up, you see that promo code within your um, you know, application and then within the application, and then you just join. So these are all features of deep linking. Basically, it's either you from the link you join, you from the link you click on, it's prefuse the application with some data, or it takes you straight into a particular screen, right? Um, that's actually deep linking. So um, this can actually help users to enjoy your app, you know, through different flavors. Uh, uh, but then you as a developer as well, you can also leverage on it to make your testing really, really fast. So for example, you want to test whether adding an item to cart works on a mobile application that is uh, for an e-commerce platform. You want to make sure you don't want to do something like sign up, mm -hmm. then log in. After login, list product, add product to cart, and then make sure the add the product. Uh, maybe you add two product to cart. You want to make sure it is two items that are there, and the title of this item, each item are the title of the items that you added. So these are like you know normal use case scenario. Instead of doing that, do you want to like maybe uh, write an helper that will create an account for the user, and then it just you know um, jumps into that particular screen where you can add a particular item, the uh, UI, the test will click on an item, click on the second one, and then you check your card, make sure the number of items is two, the total is the amount, and you know, it's just straightforward. Because that way, if login is failing, it will not affect that particular screen because you are jumping the login flow so that one test does not depend on the other. Yeah. Okay. Um... So how hectic is end-to-end -end tests and how long does it take to carry out an end-to-end -end test? I think, uh, I think I answered this question yeah, earlier. I don't know why like I said, it doesn't really take long at all to write an end-to-end -end test. However, also running an end-to-end -end test doesn't take time, but when your entire end-to-end -end tests are running like you know as a whole it takes a lot of time that's why the developers are usually advised to make sure tests are not dependent um tests are um deep linking is actually like you know leverage on global us is a leverage on so that you don't have to like click so many back 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 before you get to log out there's a global logout button somewhere you know things that can make the um experience uh, you know easier and faster any hack around it you can actually leverage on it so it's not really hectic to write end-to-end -end test but as 
you know, you're testing many features and it's as if something, someone is really tapping on those icons, tapping on those, you know, buttons, moving through different screens one by one. That's why it looks like it takes a lot of time and it's hectic, but it's not really hectic per se. Yeah. Okie dokie. Um, so I know that you have mentioned this limitations. Limitations of, of detox. Of detox. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, well, based on the demand, I'll still mention them again. Um, external app dialogue. So maybe there's a pop up or another. I mean, you know, you for example, let's say the name of your app is um Sabalo, for instance. You're testing the Sabalo app, and then you need to like um undo Google login. So you know that's like another dialogue entirely. So that's a problem. Or you want to control other apps. Maybe you need to add a calendar um, invites. You know, maybe you need to add a cal calendar schedule or you need to, you know, do something that have to do with some other app within your phone, within the phone, which might not be possible. You know, controlling other apps or processes is not possible. Um, these are like limitations. But like I said, you could mock these things while you manually ensure that they work as expected. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. I know in the chat um there were other or like similar tools um the that has been used, you know, for end-to-end -end tests. I I'm curious to know if they have oh. the, do all tools have the same limitation or is there any magical uh, tool that could pass? So to be honest, to be honest, I have not uh I, it's only in detox that we have some of most of these limitations and that's because um we are dealing with a mobile platform testing too um even in cypher there are a couple of limitations as well uh, for instance you dealing with high frame you know i think every tool have their limitations um and these are due to security reasons and restrictions over time not like they were designed to be like that um someone was asking someone is asking how do we do they ask question to the slide just scan that qr code and you'll be able to like ask questions um i think we the last question what do you recommend for the type of end-to-end -end test uh okay so like i said earlier we have uh, selenium selenium is really rich and is available in several languages there's selenium for java there's selenium you can write selenium in java you can write it in python you can write it in uh, javascript at least i've written selenium in I, i'm not sure if it was, it was one i used when i was writing ruby but i'm very sure I, i've used it extensively with python before and i've also written selenium in javascript very well um also, another one that is really new and very, very versatile uh, is Cypress. Yeah, a lot of companies now use Cypress for uh, testing. In fact, if a React or if a React or VJS developer, I recommend. If a React developer, I recommend you learn Cypress. If a VJS developer, I like, recommend you use. Um, uh, yeah, Cypress is also really cool for VJS as well. Yeah. Um, when it comes to the vertical horizontal, yeah. I'm talking about horizontal now because you are um you are just in testing the UI directly uh, with, along with the integration whether it works. Uh, for vertical, you um for vertical you are testing you know across the testing pyramid. So for unit testing, you want to use something like Jest. Uh, some people would prefer to use Mocha, Mocha, Mocha and Chai uh which is also a very very good um option for testing um a lot of these um testing tools they have a very well document uh documented uh document they have a very good documentation on the official site and there are a lot of community effort around you know making it easy to adapt by teams thank you very much and this is the most person who has asked a question on the chat. So let me stop share for I it. think the best thing is yet to find out that we're using Angela chat now, not Slack. Oh, um, yes. So please, we have moved and migrated from yeah. Slack and we're now on Andela chat. Um, but I could see some questions on, you know, the chat already. Um, how do you, from Kristen, how do you fit end-to-end -end tests? Okay, I think you may have answered this. Yeah. For example, one can run end to end test for going to production. If you have a very active workflow where feature branches go directly to production, do you think it's a good idea to have end to end before the feature deploys to production? If yes, how do you yeah. manage 
this environment. Yeah, I think it's called like someone actually asked at the question already. Yeah, it's called exactly. regression. So yeah, exactly. So you 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 write it test incrementally as you implement each of the features and then you want to make sure those tests that have been passed in already are not affected they all work as expected you don't want a new feature to affect a previous feature and if that happens you want to be sure that it's actually an intended change not an unprecedented one so basically that just to improve the confidence around you know your application development yeah Okay, and I think there's another question. What about Cucumber um, page object model architecture for testing? Well, um, I'm well, Cucumber is actually used along with Cypress. Um, I remember in the past I used it along with Cypress for um, testing. However, these days I don't see much need for Cucumber unless in special cases. Um, the Cypress have a lot of helpers and you know um, enhancement now that uh, you know I don't see a need for Cucumba anymore to be honest. Yeah, I'd like to know how to manage the test environments. So we need as many environments as the feature patches. No, 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 no. So basically, you could have um, a, you could have test data. So within your E two E, um, within your E two E. Um, directory so basically you have utilities you have helpers and then you have some test, you have test data so those test data will help you to you know for example you have a, a sample user data and then that's the user that you'll be using so maybe you have an e-commerce platform where you have like um sellers you have buyers you have anonymous people like guests people that don't want to sign up but they want to buy uh you know you simulate their data data that will created by the back end not on a good day you simulate them you know you put them within your uh, you put them in your um your test data um directory and then these are the data that you will be referring to you were referencing when you want to um when you want to um, run those tests yeah 